oh, hey, all these familiar faces. There's Jody and Dave and David. Oh, and Aaron and Cody. Oh, I love this. Oh, hey, there's Aaron and Michael. Oh, this is so nice. It's your virtual the whole gang. Game, right? Exactly. I love it. And Nick is here. <laughs> the whole oh, gang is wow. here. <laughs> Hey everybody, Peter Maravella is here, hoping this finds you all well. I'd like to welcome you to City Lights Live, the virtual reading series that follows in the footsteps of our in-store calendar during the time of the pandemic. We are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral grounds of the Ramatish Ohlone peoples, from where we continue to celebrate the works of authors we know and love with readings, discussions, and forums, moving toward the winter solstice and beyond, and hopefully towards a COVID-free era. Tonight, we are thrilled to be celebrating a City Lights published book. Actually, we just had one last night, and we are thrilled to have one yet again tonight. As many of you know, City Lights is a publishing house as well as a bookstore. Uh, we continue to publish works of literary merit and social responsibility with over 200 titles in print. We publish cutting-edge fiction, poetry, memoirs, literary translations, and books on vital social and politi political issues. Tonight, we are celebrating the new book titled A Quilt for David. The author is Stephen Raines, and the book eulogizes and brings to light a hitherto hidden history of a gay man who got caught up in the prejudice of a small conservative Florida town in the early 90s during the height of the AIDS epidemic. Dr. David Acer was scapegoated and villainized in a really grotesque kind of spectacle of tabloid media frenzy. The book explores the illness of a society that allowed this to happen. And arrives to us in a really timely way as the current pandemic appears to also be characterized by medical misinformation and cultural bias. So Stephen Raines is a poet and educator living in Los Angeles. He was appointed the first poet laureate of West Hollywood. He has produced two previous collections of writing, Inheritance and Your Dead Body is My Welcome Mat, as well as over a dozen chapbooks. Mr. Raines edited My Life is Poetry, showcasing his students' work from the first ever autobiographical poetry workshop for LGBTQ seniors. Mr. Raines has lectured and taught writing workshops around the country to LGBTQ youth and people living with HIV. He worked for a decade as a HIV test counselor in Florida and Los Angeles. Currently, he's touring the Gay Rub, an exhibition of rubbings from LGBTQ landmarks from around the world and also has a private practice as a psychotherapist. He makes his home in West Hollywood, California. He's gonna be joined tonight by Johnny McGovern. Johnny McGovern is a comedian, podcaster, and the host and executive producer of the long running hit TV series, Hey Queen, which showcases queer stories and performers. Really great honor to have you. Please now join us in giving a warm welcome to our guests, Stephen Raines and Johnny McGovern. I will turn it over now to Johnny McGovern to get the evening off the ground. Gentlemen, welcome to City Lights Live. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's so nice to see everybody here. Uh, first of all, let's say happy birthday, Stephen Raines. Not only does he have this great book, Quilt for David, Quilt for David, Quilt for David, out, <laughs> but it's his motherfucking birthday. Happy <laughs> birthday, sweetie. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad all of you are joining me for my birthday. Um, and when we were looking at the calendar of dates to do this for a virtual event, I just felt like this is how I want to celebrate my big day. So it's so nice. So many of you were here tonight. And it's also, though, and I discovered very early on in my research, it's David Acker's birthday. And it was kind of one of the things I felt. I was surprised when you told me that, because <laughs> I was like, after you spent 10 years working on this book, the, 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 the digital launch on your birthday, which is also David Acker's birthday. I mean, there's some stuff going on there. Well, congratulations yeah. on the book. Thank the you. book is out. The book is really good. You had two big events already. You want to talk about some of those a little bit? Yeah, I had a big event in Los Angeles uh, where Ann Magnuson uh, did the Q&A there, and it was a packed um, outdoor venue, so it was COVID safe. And then I had an event in St. Louis, Missouri with and another COVID uh, safe event. And unfortunately, that couldn't happen at City Lights. Um, so this was our big virtual book launch there. And there's so many people from San Francisco. I see here there's Carl and Aaron um, from San Francisco. So it's so nice that, uh, you know, I know you would have been there in person and Lila as well, um, who's on. So maybe I'll start off by reading a couple poems okay. from the book. So those of you, you can get a sense of it. And 
just as a reminder in the chat, you can order a book. So at any point in time, um, buy the book. <laughs> if you haven't already, it's important to support. So um, I, I think that was a wonderful introduction about what the book is about. This took 10 years of research for me. And I, I think I'm just going to start with uh, a poem. And this is a pantoum form poem, so it has repeating lines. Two years, 10 months, and 29 days from diagnosis to death, David kept practicing, retired at 40 to die. From diagnosis to death, was scared of small town rumors and small town mentality. Retired at 40 to die. He used aliases at doctor's offices hours away from his home was scared of small town rumors and small town mentality. David said hiding his diagnosis was lonely and isolating. He used aliases at doctor's offices hours away from his home. Kimberly, secretly sexually active, points her finger at David. David said hiding his diagnosis was lonely and isolating. She pointed her finger at him. From diagnosis to death was two years 10 months and 29 days. And <clears throat> a patient said you weren't talkative, but nice. You would go out of your way to save her office copies of People Magazine. Eight months after your death, the weekly magazine's headline was about you. Your, your parents, Victor and Harriet, booked a hotel near the hospice, wanted to stay close to you, while investigators could no longer knock unannounced. They feared at your last days, 60 pounds lost, PCP pneumonia treatment again, you were confined to bed, a urinary catheter to piss. Weeks earlier, the public health department wanted you to go public, wanted you to tell the world of your private illness, that you were the dentist of the allegations. You declined. Your mother brought meals, KS sores throughout your mouth, white thick candidas coated your throat and digestive tract. Lying in that hospital bed, knowing death was intimate, knowing awake, of, awake not of mourners, but of revelers might follow. You feared death, the public, and more pain. A hospital staff referred to you in a chart as this unfortunate gentleman. And one of the first accusers was Kimberly Bergalis. And uh, she claimed that she was a virgin and that David Acker treating her was the only possible risk she had for HIV. And this poem is about Kimberly's father. And I think it just gives a small window into what it was like uh, in the Bergalis household. In 1989, George Bergalis attempted to make a dental appointment and was declined. He was told the dentist was in the hospital. To ensure a safe sale of the business, patients were told David had cancer. George directed the Fort, Fier the Fort Pierce Finance Department and said to his staff, you watch. The guy's probably got AIDS. And the last poem I'll read is uh, where the title comes from of the book. I had sew a quilt for you. I would grab a needle, put the thread in my mouth, moisten the fibers together. I'd pierce into the eye. I'd hem, backstitch, side stitch, a remembrance of you. I'd put your name in large letters, wanting no one to forget you died of it too. I'd sew you into that larger quilt because no one else has. I'd select patterns, design a quilt representing your lifelong loves. Kimberly has four panels. I'd sew for you, thimble on my thumb, push the threaded needle through the fabric. If I were to prick my finger and bleed, I wouldn't regret a single drop of blood or effort.
so let's talk about the book. For those of you that don't know, because when you just hear those pieces, you might not really know what the story of David Acker is. So let's start with that because it's a very compelling story. So much so that when Stephen told me about this book, I said, this is a true crime story. And I thought, that, but the piece is actually very literary poetry and prose, but underneath it is kind of very compelling story of homophobia, possible lies, uh, uh, insurance scamming. So talk about what the story of David Acker is in case someone out there really sure. doesn't know, there's no context for those poems, which are very beautiful, <laughs> but what? how does this relate to A Quilt for David and what is the story of A Quilt for David? Sure, in 1991, eight people came forward and said that their HIV infection was due to their dentist. And the first person who came forward was Kimberly Brigalis, who I read that poem about. And it was only, you know, 20 years later, I started thinking about that situation. And, you know, I grew up, you know, uh, at that era of like, when I was young, it's nothing but stories about HIV or AIDS. Right. And then the there was all sorts of horror stories, pick up the phone, has a thing, now you've got AIDS. I mean, like it, it fed into, a lot of those urban legend myths and the dentist who gave all of his patients AIDS. I remember hearing it as a kid. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and then that, that time of like HIV hysteria. Right, it's just the homophobia so was strong. The HIV hysteria was strong. You could get it from anything, you know what I mean? So that's where, the, that's the time and place that, that David Acker was at. Yes, and the people um, who accused him you know, it was such a hot story at the time because it really tapped into, you know, this the archetype of the virgin, Kimberly Brigalis. And mm -hmm. it also had, you know, this thing about like how like gay men and being diseased and how like gay men can harm other people. Right. Because he was a closeted, closeted, devilish gay man. He gave them all AIDS. I mean, that's yeah. where everybody was at at that time. Yeah. And and it's actually kind of where I was too when I thought about the situation 20 years later. I was working as an HIV educator mm. and that was in uh, California and in Florida. I did it um, for 10 years. And while I was there one day at work, I, I remember the situation and I thought like, how, how did that dentist give his patients AIDS? I mean, that was, that was the thought I had. And it was only when doing research that I, you know, that homophobia that you're talking about, that HIV hysteria, it was in every single article I was reading. Mm. And I knew that David Acker or the true science about what happened wasn't really, um, it didn't have an opportunity to present itself in that kind of environment. In this book, you really blow the roof off the case. I mean, I'm <laughs> not, not to sound funny, but how did you go from like, you're a poet, you're an HIV counselor. What made you put on your Sherlock Holmes hat, get a big <laughs> magnifying glass, head down to Florida and start asking questions about David Acker? And what was the response from people being like, who the fuck are you? And why are you asking questions about the dentist? Like, how did you jump fully into it? You spent 10 years working on this. Yeah, I don't um, No, It just started with the question of what happened to that dental office. Uh -huh. And I really wanted to find out. So it was just kind of that pursuit. And as a creative person, just having that question or those creative urges and just following them and knowing that cognition comes later. And so you started gathering evidence. Okay. And you're, so what's the process? Then so you're like, I've got, I've, I think I've solved this 20 year old <laughs> situation. Now I'm going to write a poem. Like what's the creative process that went into it? I started writing as I was going along and I thought that maybe it would be a very kind of linear, straightforward book. And, but you know, my notes were almost poetry as well. Mm -hmm. And I, as a poet, it's the form I love. And then it also seemed like a really great way to tell the stories through poetry right. because the, the the reality and the data and the science they were always there and it was very convenient um that people got so caught up in their emotions that they kind of ignored those it, they ignored um more likely um reasons right and and so i thought if poetry is the language of our emotions i can use poetry to help people empathize with david acker and and you know, through that emotional experience for people to kind of look at the whole of what was happening. 
And yeah, in that research, like I went to courthouses, I went to the local library to look at press clippings. Don't forget about the phone calls to landlines. <laughs> yes. How many landlines, how many old ladies who used to work in dental office or hang out in gay clubs in the mid eighties in Florida did you have to dial? And what did they say to you when you were calling about this? So I, yeah, I, you know, what did they say? I, I got so many varied responses. At one time, I put an ad in the newspaper stating that I was looking to talk to friends, family, coworkers of David Acker. And because of the age of people who might have associated with David, I felt like my email address was not enough. Mm. So I naively put my home phone number in. And so my phone rang often. Not <laughs> I bet it did. What was fascinating about that is how many people called to give me their opinions. And then the more I talked with them, the more it became clear they never knew David Acker. Some of them didn't even live in the area at that time. And they just felt like they, they have an opinion and so that they should call me. There were some kind of more uh, very harsh calls about why are you investigating a murderer? Um, but then I also got phone calls from, you know, that that woman who said that the dentist would save her office copies of People magazine. Mm. There was another woman who told a story of David uh, giving her theater tickets that he didn't use, and she was an actress. And, and that's how it started. And eventually, I started talking to people who were friends with David, who socialized with him. When the CDC did their investigation, they did not find any sexual partners. And, you know, I on my own was able to locate a sexual partner, David Ackers. <clears throat> so, yeah, it was it really was kind of like a Sherlock Holmes experience. Yeah, I mean, you really, I mean, in the book, if you get the book, and the book is a quilt for David, ladies and gentlemen, it's available <laughs> at citylights.com, stephenrains.com, a quilt for david.com. So, we're going to want to purchase a couple of copies. Um, I mean, but the thing is, in the book, if you get in the book, you have like taken the layer of lies and homophobia off of what happened. Now, you don't, it's not all hard evidence, but you've really uncovered a lot of information, which shows that perhaps David Acker was wrongly accused and a lot of people were scamming the insurance company. Yeah, there was a lot of money to be made by these accusations. And also um, kind of like every detail in the book I want the reader to be assured that it came from research of mm -hmm. my own. I took no poetic license in this book. Mm -hmm. There's like, I don't have any of my musings. It was a story that was saturated with misinformation that I didn't want to add to it. Right. So, you know, when you read these details, it is what, it is information that I encountered, um, whether previously printed or I encountered through those interviews firsthand. I mean, and you know, in in reading the book and in our discussions of the book, we both can relate to David Acker in a way, as you know that from that time in life where we're all finding out about our sexuality, we're still in the closet, and David Acker was living in a very homophobic community, deep in the closet. He would go to the discos every other week. <laughs> he would go far to, to Tampa or something, right, so that no one would know who he is, and you know that you know, as a gay man, we can like sort of reach through time and see David Acker and relate to certain elements uh, about him uh, in ourselves. Completely, completely. Yeah, he would travel two hours south to Fort Lauderdale in Miami. And I actually moved to Florida two years after he died and would go to some of the same bars that he went to. Um, so later on, like, I was like, oh, I, you know, I, I knew those dance floors. What's really sad is he was so deeply in the closet and so concerned about his patients finding out that he had HIV, um, which would have affected his livelihood, that he would travel that same route that he used to travel to socialize. He did that to see doctors and use aliases at those doctor's offices. And, you know, David, like a lot of men, the indication that he was positive was a KS lesion. Right. And, and, you know, it's sad. There's a poem in the book about David treating uh, lesions on the roof of his mouth. And it, it was really scary for a lot of men. And, you know, being in a small conservative town, 
like David was, it, um, it, it was pretty terrible. And Kimberly Bergalis, who was his first accuser, who were, there's evidence that maybe she wasn't all that she said she was, but she was on, she has many panels on the AIDS quilt, right? And the reason why you titled this book, Quilt for David. Yes, is because David doesn't have one. And, and I felt like this book is my quilt for David. I also felt like through these like patchwork poems, it, it kind of is like building a quilt. Also, when I talked about that narrative where I thought it would be a very just traditional nonfiction book, you know, for something that was 20, 25 years ago, like it's now been 30 years, but there are so many holes in the story. And a, I felt like this was the best way to, to tell the story and kind of move on. Um, there are some things that uh, I only found out later since the book has come out. Uh, a very sweet story. There was a woman who, at the time, I, I really wanted to get a hold of her. I found the, the name and um, of his hospice nurse. And I have a huge box at my house just filled with research. And one is a folder called Contacts. And she was at the top of the list. And it was only after the book came out. I just thought, I wonder if I could find her now. Mm. And I did. And I talked with her. And it was so sweet to hear how David's parents, who, you know, I share this in the book, that when David was sick, that's when he came out to his mom. His mom was religious. And her and her stepfather, her and, her, um, and David's stepfather, moved to Florida to take care of David towards the end of his life. And they ended up uh, staying in his home after he died. But his mother was bedside uh, with him the entire time. And the hospice nurse uh, said she even remembers the room number he was in. And like the poem states that he was using an alias. So um, he was, you know, that his real name wasn't on the door at the time. And wow. so he died in secrecy. And there's that small window of you know, he, he lived in secrecy and there was that window of time where he was open and then how painful to go back and be secretive. Yeah. I mean, speaking of secrets, it took a lot of digging for you to find this picture. Yes. Of David Acker. Tell yeah. that story. So there aren't a lot of public images of David Acker and the family, though they were nice to me, they chose to not uh, fully participate. And I even asked for photos. Um which they declined so there are a few wow yeah i mean that goes to show you the hell those people have probably been through i mean they yeah. wrote a book saying their son was literally a serial killer and now they don't even want to give a picture for yeah. a work supporting him <laughs> that can you imagine how horrible people have meant to them for so many years wow oh yeah and how much pain this caused their family how i talk in the book how it affects how it affected other family members and also anything that was said to the media was turned into something spurious. So at one point in time, he, um, uh, someone had said how David had told them a story about like, oh, you know, I used to get ulcers and now I try to let things roll off my back, which is something I think all of us would, would say. Mm -hmm. But instead like that, that became this quote that was used against him about how he was unfeeling and didn't care. And wow. so I, I think the family, there was also, you know, Kimberly Regalis and the some of the others accusers, they hired a lawyer, Robert Montgomery, who was a high powered lawyer, really good at spinning the media. Mm. And, you know, it, it was such a machine and such a historical time that it's, I, I think the family just chose to remain silent and they've chosen to do so. So how did you get the pick? Oh, so that is his yearbook photo from, wow. from grad school. And I, I love the image. And actually, um, Geraldine is the designer of City Lights who did it. And it's actually her father's birthday today as well, wow. her late father. Um, so my birthday, David Acker's birthday, Geraldine's birth, uh, father's birthday. Uh, what, what you can't see, which I think is very sweet about the photo is his hair kicks out like right here on, on your book cover. You can see it a little bit. And it just reminded me of, you know, like school, like to me, it was such a sweet part of the image that, you know, that on school picture day, do you remember like trying to fix your hair or combing it? And school picture day, any type yeah, of exactly. picture snaps. I'm sure David Acker was getting his little twists. <laughs> Gotta get my twists. 
Yeah. You have feeling when you see this picture, you get some feeling for you know the humanity of somebody who's been so dehuman dehumanized for so many years and turned into like a, a monster. Yeah, definitely. And there's so many photos out there of the people who um, claim to have been victimized by him that it was really nice that, um, you know, to have been able to find the photo and have rights to it. And then also for the city lights and the designer there to choose, like, it really was a good image to put it on. And um, Amy Shoulder, the editor, um, she really, uh, she came up with a coloring idea and really liked the idea of his face being on the cover. So I'm glad that happened. Well, this makes me think of a little game we're going to play together here uh, it, based on Look at Her from Hey Queen, but this is a literary event. So we're <laughs> going to say, hmm, I don't know what we'll say. It's, 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 it's spectacle at them. I don't really know. Gaze upon it is All what right. we'll call this game. Gaze upon it. All right. So now you have to run the game with your hands. Oh, all right. Work. But I, I prepared all of these as surprises okay, screen. for you. I guess we need to share, We're gonna the, share screen. the screen. We're going to show you some pictures and you are going to gaze upon it. And you're going to tell, give us uh, your impressions of what you're seeing. I'm seeing white. All right. Okay, this is a deep snowy. Okay, first gaze upon it. TLW Magazine. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you know what you're seeing, but that young stud, much like David Acker, <laughs> loved to go clubbing in Fort Lauderdale. He wore a platform boot. Which is true. Yeah. And he later became a sister of perpetual indulgence. A young Stephen Range, everyone. So this is, I was, I don't even know what year that was, but I was on the cover of the magazine and I thought I was like such a hot writer. And I thought this would happen for the rest of my life. Like, it's a great was, pick. Like, lots of like, I'm, I'm going to be on the cover of lots oh, of magazines. So many. This is just the first. And actually the second time I was on the cover of a magazine was only last year. So, um, well, but you know, some people don't get any cover, sweetie. So you're good. All right. Next, your kicky young work <laughs> with the title that always makes me smile when people say it at literary events and they introduce you. Your dead body is my welcome mat. Tell me about this, your earliest work. Yeah, I was 25 years old when the book came out. What a stud. You must have been <laughs> like, I'm getting all the poetry pussy up in here, everybody. <laughs> I mean, look at that. It's it was, What year did that come out? Oh, I don't know. Well, 20, um, yeah, 20 years ago. Well, actually 21 to, since it's my birthday. 2000. I mean, this is the height of style for 2000. So right. tell me about Black this and book. white. Yes. So Shirtless. it's, I mean, very angsty book, just like any 25 year old would write. And um, the last time I saw the book for sale, it, because there was a small printing by Grenadier Press, the last time I saw it for sale, it was like $700. I don't think anyone bought it for that price, but good luck if they're getting that. I mean, let's reprint it, City Life. Come <laughs> on now. All right, next up, gaze upon it <laughs> in the room. This is a uh, is a chat book. Um, and now explain a chat book for those like me that are always like, what is a chat book again? It's just a small, slim volume. A slim of volume, right? And I printed it myself. And it was similar to my obsession with David Acker in this case and situation. I was obsessed with elephants. I think mm. this is about 2005, 2006. I mean, so much so that it's all I would do in my spare time is I would like read about elephants. I would watch elephant documentaries. I could tell you that if you're like, I was so obsessed with elephants. I did not know this about you. <laughs> and you had an elephant phase, but I like it. <laughs> I remember not, I was seeing a therapist and not telling her about the elephants because I just thought it was so wacky. Like, I just thought I was so, and then I started writing a poem about, brace yourself, it's about elephant abuse. So in this, in this chat book, I on have, brand. I, on is the brand. name? Yeah, um, always, yeah. So it's a chat book where I wrote about elephants throughout history and their mistreatment. Um, and I thought in the room is, you know, because that's the elephant. Um, you'd be surprised it didn't sell well, but um, thankfully. Elephant was... abuse poetry didn't sell well? That's outrageous. 
I mean, it's great cover art. <laughs> right? I know. Thank you, Thaddeus Root, who did that. Instead. Very nice. I mean, I'm just note to self, get T. Steven elephant stuff <laughs> for his birthday. All right. Gaze upon it. My life is poetry. That's the, um, that's the anthology I created from the workshop, from the My Life is Poetry workshop. And there are some people in the room who are a part of the workshop. So it's yeah, so nice tell, to see tell you, people what that which is, is an auto, which is an autobiographical poetry workshop for LGBTQ seniors. Mm -hmm. And I've been teaching it for about 17 years now, 16, 17 years. I love that. And um, you've been to some of the readings. I have. Um, and it is such powerful work that's happening in that workshop. And I'm and it's great to see so many people grow as poets, but also how poetry changes their lives and how it creates community. So 17 years you've been doing that? Maybe 16 or 17, yeah. Claps. I mean, <laughs> I love to see someone working with uh, our seniors and bringing the creativity out of them. Why? Because we're going to be seniors soon and I want someone to still be grabbing my creativity <laughs> too. That's great. I love that. Yeah. And so that book, um, Dorothy Allison wrote the preface and it's, I mean, the first time I read it, I cried and Jenny Walters did these beautiful portraits of the seniors and it's now out of print and uh, City Lights, I got a whole <laughs> bunch of things for you to reprint. I mean, we have the dead body of my welcome mat. Okay. Ele Elephant abuse poetry is on brand for 2021. We're going to need a re-release of In the Room. And if you don't re-put out My Life is Poetry, um, it, wouldn't that be wrong? SCL. Let's go. Oh, wait, now this Oh, you're in this. I know. So and finally, we get to something with <laughs> cock on the, the cover, and you're like, you're in this one. So I gaze upon it. This is what this game is called. Gaze upon gaze it. Gaze upon it. That's a cute. That's mm -hmm. good. So I loved the vagina monologues. And I thought one day I was just like, well, where's where's the show where men are talking about their assholes? Oh. Like, and and so I created um a event where I invited performance artists and writers to talk about their assholes and it was called the whole story just in case y'all thought this was going to be too classy <laughs> we are keeping it real okay <laughs> and then the um the the second the second night of performance was called come as you are mm -hmm. which was about come and the third was cocktails. So it was men talking about their penises. Right. I mean, and they were all great events. <laughs> yes. Someone put paint up their butt and spray did a spray uh, a spray art installation. Yes. I mean, yes. there was spray. all from monologues to lip sync to anal art. Yes, it was a be beautiful night. Um, and then Darren Klein approached me and he wanted to create books out of it. And uh, Christopher helped. And it's um, so you're part of those books. It's they're really beautiful. Um, right. They're like little zines with art and pictures from the event and all the each artist is given their version of the written version of the work. I loved it. These wait, are great. And these are actually for sale in City Lights. Your City Lights was selling them at one point in time and they might have sold out, but I think City they, Lights, <laughs> you know what you gotta do. Oh, here you are at another classy book event. <laughs> So I love, love, love the Tom of Finland Foundation. Mm -hmm. And yes. this was a collection, My Queer Eye. Um, or is it My Gay Eye? I'm forgetting right now. I think it's My Gay Eye. And um, I was talking on stage about it. And I also have a piece in that book. And it, they they publish it annually. So it's, it's a great publication. Wait, let's talk about those boots. Look at those boots. You are dressed <laughs> for the event. It's like, how can I be literary yet tough? And in those boots are the key. I, mean, I feel like I nailed that look, right? You did. I mean, that's You're good. in it's a very, parking lot. There are people, there's um, all, this, this is all, this is very good. Oh. Okay, gaze upon it. Guys reading poems. So Hunter Lee Hughes approached me about using two, I want to say three though, of my poems in his book, and I'm sorry, in his movie, Guys Reading Poems. So check it out. I think it's even on Netflix right now or Apple. Um, and if you, if anyone gets the chance of having their poetry in a movie, I would definitely suggest it. I mean, what year was that? It was just like four years ago. Oh, and do you give a seductive reading or? A oh, wait, I'm not. No, it's just my work. Just I'm your not, work? Just, 
you know what? Sequel, let's rewind that. You need to, like, come on. We've all seen you read. You get into it. You get emotional. You need the camera. Zoom right in. All right. Keep going. Gaze upon it. This looks this, like we're in David Acker country. Am I right? Yes. So this is David Acker's office, which um, wow. there are several poems that I uh, talk about uh, what happened in that office and what became of the office later on. And what so, did become of the office later? At one point in time, Denny's? it became a nightclub. It kind of looks like oh, it, it does. It's like very Florida nightclub yeah, vibes. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. there he is. Yeah. So this is the other public photo of David, mm. and this is the photo that was in People magazine and on news programs. Um, and I think he just looks really sweet in that photo. Shame on you, People magazine, for hate mongering like that. Who's this? This is uh, the last accuser, uh, Sherry Johnson, mm. who um, was young like Kimberly Bergalis, uh, and it they think that she might have even just had a dental cleaning. So, uh, but she was also represented by Robert Montgomery and got a settlement. Um, this is Ed Parsons, who. Uh, went on television and said that he was a friend of David Acker's and said that David, he, he created these kind of lies that um, the CDC said it wasn't believable and other people didn't say it was believable, but he just kind of, um, and, and he also had some facts wrong about David. So he was someone so this who was, was he was that thirsty friend, semi-friend yes. of David Acker who got in front of, who got addicted to the cameras. Yes. I'm talking shit about David Acker. Great. Thanks for nothing, bro. This was the wow, ad. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So this is the ad um, without my number. So that was the ad that started it all. And um, I, I used that photo of him. Did you have to take this to a Kinko's? Because it was like <laughs> 2000 to get that printed. Actually, Clement Hill Goldberg is the one who helped me. To, I was like, because no, I, I had it in a newspaper and I didn't, I didn't even have, like, I was so broke. I to pay for their graphic designer. So Clement, like, is the one who did that. God bless. I know. This is David's uh, grave marker. Now, did you start, how did, was the gay rub attached in any way with the David Acker story? I mean, because you're, you're, you have a long-term project. That's a great segue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so That's um, why I'm here, sweetie, okay? <laughs> Thanks for calling it out. So this, you can see in the front of the book, is um, a rubbing of David Acker's grave marker, which you see there. And that's actually Amy's shoulder came up with that idea. And the minute she said it, it's just like my heart, like saying, I was like, it's such a brilliant idea. And it's so nice that this is how the book starts with David's image. And then it's really just kind of representing like the beginning of his life and the end of his life and having it there. And the gay rub, for those who don't know, is a art project I have that's a collection of rubbings from LGBTQ landmarks across the country. Mm -hmm. Very important work. Yeah. So this is a Kimberly Bergalis statue. Wow. And uh, it was erected after her death and it's outside of her um, school, the school she went to. Uh, that's bronze. So just think about the time, energy, and money to memorialize her. Mm. I'm looking. Okay, this is, this is the Golden Girls house. No. <laughs> this is David's house. And wow. um, this is the house that his parents moved into, like I said, and his mom stayed there. It's also the same house where I talked to someone who was friends with uh, Hector, uh, Hector and, I'm sorry, Victor and Harriet, David's parents, and said that he was having dinner at their house <clears throat> And while dinner is going on, remember, like answering machines, how it would kind of announce the message, how while having dinner, there were several phone calls that came through the answering machine, just kind of like shouting hate. Wow. And then after dinner, Harriet showed him all the hate mail they'd gotten that week. Ouch. And so that, that happened in that house. Poor guy. We'll gaze upon it. What is this? It's a citizen. So this is... Um, Claudia Rankin's book. So in the middle of writing this book, not even in the middle towards the end, I was like, what am I doing? I didn't know what I was doing. And then 
this Claudia Rankin Citizen came out and it kind of, I felt like it gave me permission to keep going. Mm, how so? That it's non-traditional poetry and, <clears throat> and kind of poetry that was doing a little bit more than what we're used to. It's not just confessional poetry. And um, so that was quite nice. The Kimberly Bergalis Memorial Beach. Wow. Um, so Kimberly Bergalis has a statue, a beach named after her, four panels on the quilt. And I think it's important for people to look at, like, why was it that this person received so much and others received so little? Mm. And it's, um, you know, in, in the treatment of others, the disparity there between Kimberly and the other accusers, um, between Kimberly and David, and also between, you know, and also looking at how thousands and thousands of people were being treated at that time compared to these accusers. Right. So this is Tim Miller, uh -huh. who I feel like, you know, in um, in movies where people pick up dusty books and they and they blow the dust off of it. I feel like that's what Tim Miller did with this manuscript. Mm. He, I felt really kind of stuck. And at one point in time, he's like, mm, let me see that manuscript. And he was, and I gave it to him and it really helped. He just said so many encouraging words. And, and so that was helpful. Well, help from a legend. All right. Yeah. And this, gaze upon it. David Trinidad, who then after Tim gave me encouraging words and I worked on the manuscript some more and some more. And then um, David Trinidad gave some of the greatest input with this book. And, you know, I had tiles on all the work and he said, they're not necessary. They're not doing work. And he said it. And I was like, yes, you're right. And he just made so many insightful edits and comments. So um, it was nice to have his help. Um, oh, City Lights. Um, so this is the bookstore that said yes, and the publisher mm -hmm. that said yes, and that's Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Um, so I'm, I was so happy to be published by City Lights. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, everyone knows of City Lights and their history and where they're located. And it's just such an institution. So not only was I excited at the beginning of the experience, but throughout it, because they have been amazing. And when I, you know, there's so many like terrible, like publisher stories. And I feel for those people because I feel like I had the best case scenario ever and everyone's been so delightful. So I appreciate that. And this is Amy Shoulder, who is my editor and served as my agent. She's the one who approached City Lights. And after um, I worked on the edits, and I didn't know what to do with the book. Amy's a very dear friend. And she said, oh, well, let me look at it. And she we then met up for a drink so it was nice to have a cocktail for this conversation uh -huh. and it wasn't the cocktail that did it but when she was telling me that she wanted to represent the book it was so such a surprise to me i didn't know she was talking about my like i just mm. got so confused because it's um me yeah exactly. And my mom? <laughs> exactly. can i interest you in something about elephant abuse as well <laughs> while we're at it so um <laughs> So that's Amy, and she actually started her career um, at City Lights, working at City Lights, um, and she's part of the City Lights family. So it's absolutely amazing. And also one of those um, collaborations, like when working with a good friend, um, mm -hmm. that like there was never like, even like the slightest tension or moment. Um, so it's, Amy's been part of that wonderful experience. So this is Stacy, who uh, uh -huh. works at City Lights. Yep. And the first conversation, I was kind of nervous to have a conversation with Stacy, the first person I interacted with at City Lights. <laughs> and Stacy said so many glowing things about my book. Mm. And also Stacy didn't know me. So everyone who had given input on the book liked me. And there was a part of me that just felt like, oh, they're only saying that because they like me right. or they're advocating. And I could have like, I just like, oh no, what did you say, Stacey? I couldn't hear you say it again because I just like- There's a <laughs> need to, I just, I had some literary in my ear and I'm going to repeat. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful you say. And I'm uncovering truths that would never been uncovered before. Say it again. That is exactly what it was like. 
And then also, um, so like we'll send emails back and forth and Stacey will say like, oh, well, let's jump on the phone. And so it's always nice to talk with her and she's been absolutely amazing to work with. Um, and that's her with her husband, I believe. So he's wearing a chihara. <laughs> uh, and then the, um, the publisher, the head of City Lights, um, she is an, also an editor and has been so supportive and um, which is also really a great photo, right? It in, really in, is. In City Lights. Mm -hmm. I mean, and just like looking at the pictures of City Lights, and you're like, oh, I, just, I love a bookstore with tons of queer books. Yes. It like opens up a whole world to you when you go in. Yeah. And representing everyone mm -hmm. in that bookstore. Mm -hmm. The second floor is only poetry. So in a world where like so many- That is rare. <laughs> It's so many bookstores where I'm like, oh, where's the poetry section? It's like two shelves. Right, a slim yeah, section. City Lights is like, noble. we're taking over the top. Yeah. Go City mm -hmm. Lights. And then oh, us. So me, this is so in my, the, <laughs> the mask I used to wear to just give myself amusement during the high <laughs> days of the pandemic. A mask with my own face yeah. on it, which when you would put it wrong, like it is in this photo, I looked deformed and people would give me a second look at the grocery <laughs> store they'd be like hey or they're like, oh my god oh, that's a mask and they'd be relieved when it, it was a mask because if it's up correctly it looks like me but if it's down like that that looks like a monster that could come out of your closet to kill you and so that's us with alex besley and this is how we spent most of the pandemic was get, doing walks around the neighborhood right. which is how i socialized with everyone and you were part of my bubble and we're mm -hmm. bubbling now so that was really we're nice bubbling now this arcade is what became of David Acker's office. Wow. And a casino or arcade? Well, it's kind of like an arcade. So I think it's one of those things in Florida, you know, Florida can be sketchy. Uh -huh. So it's one of those things where you can't, you can't, you, you couldn't pay cash. You had to charge up a card. Right. And then you. That's just how things work. Okay. And then, Florida at arcades. Yeah. yeah. And then you, and like, so. But it couldn't, I think there were certain words that couldn't be used. Um, and so this is a good time for the, I'm going to read one poem, um, which is how the book ends, which is about this arcade. <clears throat> because of course, while I was there, I was like, I'm gonna play a game. Like I wanna right. see if I could win. But this is actually like, what you're looking at now is where David's office was. Um, and you know what I'm looking at? Do you see in that photo? Do you see the the pot of gold and the rainbow? I would have maybe written a poem about that, or, but it's not in this poem, so don't, don't. All right. The lights from the casino machines blinked and brightened, begged for attention. I sat in the corner at one of the slot machines and inserted my card to play. It was the corner of the arcade where David Acker's office once was. I wanted to stand on the floor, see the windows patients looked out on when in David's chair. On the last day of my last trip to the Treasure Coast, I stood in the building where all of it happened. This is where history was made and rewritten and misinterpreted and misdirected. The machine had a button inside of, instead of a side lever. I played Robin Hood, elected electric reels of three images that need to be aligned to win. On the ground that I stood, I was taking risks. The patients took risks unknowingly. David took risks unknowingly. There are no sure things. No one comes out clean. Everyone feels cheated. I think the appropriate ending for snaps, right? I'm a clapping queen, but this is appropriate. <laughs> Um, what didn't make it in the book? You spent oh. 10 years on this. You uncovered a lot of interesting truth. You put it out in something beautiful, but, uh, what didn't make it in? Um, there was a moment when David was trying to sell his practice mm. that, um, <clears throat> I'm tempted to use the name of the company, but I'm not going to, you, it is in the book though, but the man in the practice you know, David built this practice and was trying to get as much money for it to sell it, scared. And the man to David's face, and I think he said it to, it, not just to be nosy, but to devalue David's practice, maybe so he could get a better price for it. But he said to David's face, you know, there are rumors you have AIDS. Wow. 
And David replied, I'm hopeful about my future. And it, it just, it, it was so hard to kind of put that in a poem or try to like, try to even like, even as I talk about it now, I get teary of like trying to encapsulate it, but it was only at the reading here at the book release in LA that I thought, um, I mean, one that, that just says something about like, he had a sense of hope, but also that like, I'm hopeful about my future. Like this is the future, right? And like, we're all a part of it. And we get to like, um, I get to write this story. You get to experience it and read it. And so maybe the truth coming out is that hopefulness, you know, like it's, so yeah, that, that's the one thing that didn't make it in the book. And I just kept trying to find ways to write about it. And I never did, so. Well, the most important thing that we can take away from this, here come the special effects. Buy this book. Watch it. It's in 3D. <laughs> David Acker never thought this afterlife <laughs> would be as exciting as when I was. This is a great book. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it at citylights.com. You can get it at stephenrains.com. You can get it at quiltfordavid.com. You can see the trailer for the book that I creative directed to try to make it as uh, as, as compelling as possible. <laughs> this is a great work. The audiobook is under uh, construction, correct? I keep threatening to make an audiobook, and I hope that does happen one day. If not, I'm going to just take the text and I'm going to read it <laughs> my way. And I don't think you want that. <clears throat> just kidding. Um, uh, I think our I think our time is up yeah. for this digital launch of a book for David conversation with and author Stephen Rains. He spent ten years on this. Snaps is the appropriate response. Good work. It's a great work. I hope everybody goes out and buys a copy. Any final words for these lovely people who have joined us tonight on your day of birth? I know. It's so good. I mean, it's also, I'm seeing people I've spent my birthday with in real life. So <laughs> That's um, wonderful. Wendell and, and Eddie and Adrian. So it's so nice to see everyone. So thank you very much. It means so much to me. And thank you, City Lights, for hosting this. This is my big virtual book launched and um, I hope one day to read there in person. So thank you all so much. I appreciate it. Well, thank you both. That was really fantastic. I mean, do, uh, we, we could take a few questions, couldn't we? I mean, you've got a- Why not? In the- uh, Even birthday and, comes about uh, once a year. Let's see. <laughs> Still the whole time. Shannon asks, I have heard, I've loved hearing uh, on Johnny's podcast about your research journey into constructing the book. Can you talk about your writing process? When, where, and how do you write? Any important rituals, tips for breaking through writer's block? She says, thank you. Oh, that's really, those are great questions. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that you heard the podcast where we talked about it. Right. So tips for writing. Yeah, I really believe in uh, keeping your pen moving. So those are the people who've been in my class understand. I see Nick and, and Michael nodding their head <clears throat> is to truly keep your pen moving. So I do it myself and I did it when writing this book is setting a timer and just going and mm -hmm. having my pen move. Because when my pen stops is when I start to doubt myself or question myself or I, you know, I get caught up in perfectionism. But if I keep my pen moving, it's amazing what comes out. And no one's ever harmed by writing for seven minutes um, without stopping. So uh, that would be my advice. I have a um, question from Carl who says, Stephen, this is an important book and my reaction to it was quite emotional. Mm -hmm. You've returned us to some traumatic times. Can you talk about your own emotional journey through research and writing process? Oh, my own emotional journey, research and writing. You know what was really disappointing for me is that ad that you saw. I, you know, I, I interviewed people over the phone and then I had a, and then I scheduled a trip to Florida and and to, to talk with people more. And there were some people who were going to share things with me, like photographs or, or things that they had. And right before my trip, a, a journalist by the name of Eve Samples 
uh, contacted me and she's like, what is this research? What are you doing? And I just, I wasn't, I just wasn't ready to share the information. And then she kept pressuring me and I felt like, well, if I don't say anything, you don't have a story. Well, she found a story and it ended up on the front page of the Sunday edition of their paper. And it had Kimberly front and center and it talked all about Kimberly and it talked about my ad and it's, you can read up on it online. It's like mysterious ad sparks something, you know? And when that came out, the, I picked up the paper myself from a gas station because I was in Florida when it came out. That afternoon, every single person I had scheduled to meet canceled with me. Wow. Because there's so much shame and secrecy in that town. And so for me, like, I remember just like, being feeling so alone in my hotel room and feeling like it was so out of control like how deep like secrecy and shame is and how this one article it just her article just like they evaporated and some people i did eventually talk with me but that was that was a really really hard like when we talk about how hard it was that, that was a really hard moment it was also you know carlson said i know you read the book um i only uh, there are some things that happened to David's family at the end that was really hard. And my book is, you know, a lot of this information is the first time it's been printed. So. Well, we have about run out of time, but thank you both. It's been really awesome. And I love the, the kind of show and tell. That was so much fun. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye.